an audience, you've got really heavy load of information. I hope you are not totally overwhelmed. Uh, and while I'm waiting for the first question or comment, I could use my opportunity first and ask. It's, it's a detail in a way, but, but Karsten, you were talking about those agreement uh, uh, indicators. So how, uh, how are the carrots and sticks kind of involved? Are there tight, are there tight regulations? Well, not really regulations, but it's, it's a benchmarking type of instrument. So it's, um, it's, it's more or less a, and, and a type of, uh, a type of, no, it doesn't work. So <laughs> it's a type of uh, naming and shaming uh, instrument. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, uh, region and municipality don't want to be it works now? Yeah, great. So uh, a municipality region don't want to be uh, sort of portrayed as being uh, doing uh, poorly and uh, also it's always sort of operating under the threat of intervention from the, from the national level so they know if they, if they really perform poorly uh, there might be... Yes, but there are no automatic penalties or rewards or... No. Uh, there. Yrjö Mattila, Kela. <coughs> Thank you of the very clear and presentative presentations you had. Uh, there is one question about uh, co-payments in health. In Finland we have co-payments. For example, if you are in hospital, you have to pay almost 40 euros a day but we have also annual ceilings for public expenditures. How is the situation in Norway, Denmark and Sweden? What kind of co-payments you have in healthcare? Still not connected. Oh, now it is. Uh, so the situation in Denmark: no co-payment for for primary care, uh, and no co-payment for going to the uh, to the hospital. Um, co-payment for dr uh, for pharmaceuticals, uh, dental care, and so on. So that's where the the burden is for the uh, for the citizens. In Norway. Yeah. In Norway, it's a small uh, co-payment for going to the GP. Uh, nothing in hospital, I think. Uh, ex uh, Polyclinical uh, um, treatment, then you have, a pay, have to pay a, a, a small fee. Mm. Yeah, and the Swedish sit situation is uh, also a small co-payment, but uh, there there is a ceiling uh, for maximum you can pay uh, over a year uh, for about uh, 100 euros. So it's it's not a lot. But it's the same in Norway too. Approximately 100 euros. Yeah. Mm. All right, more questions. Before giving the word to Juhani Lehto, I will hand over this microphone to Marku Pekurin, and I have to excuse myself, sorry for that, because I have a board meeting to attend. So thank you for all of you for, from my part, but now just continue to have fun with our international, international guests. Okay, Juhani. Uh, two questions. Uh, uh, how has it been possible for Denmark to to centralize the system? Because you also had very decentralized past as, as the others. And and second question, how high is the idea of, of combining social care and health care in the same administration? Now in all these countries, social care is, is at, the, at the municipal level and health care is separate. Um, yes, the first question is not so easy to answer in a, in a short note. Uh, I'm, I mean, the structural reform in 2007, uh, 
there were a lot of factors that sort of uh, came into place at, at, uh, at that particular point in time. So there was a parliamentary situation where you had a de facto majority government. Uh, and within that de facto majority government, you had uh, some major policy entrepreneurs that were willing to invest uh, political capital in, in going ahead, going forward with this. Um, and that was unusual uh, because uh, there had been several attempts, just as in Sweden and and Finland uh, before, uh, where it hadn't uh, succeeded, where there had been too much resistance uh, from the decentralized levels and from within uh, the parties. But uh, there had been some, some changes of power internally within some of the major parties, which made it uh, possible for these sort of head uh, policy entrepreneurs to, to introduce the, uh, the idea. Then there were issues about uh, how the process was controlled, uh, very tightly controlled process, not uh, not allowing a lot of time for external debates and, and doing sort of the uh, analysis uh, very close to the administration. So pushing it through from, from the national uh, bureaucratic uh, side. Um, and uh, then it, it also coincided with uh, uh, dissatisfaction with, uh, with the delivery of the, of the counties, particularly in terms of waiting times. Uh, so it was easy sort of to portray the, the counties as, as not really delivering fully uh, on, on the, on the uh, obligations they had. Uh, and at the same time, the counties didn't have too many political friends, and they were very slow at uh, discovering the threat that they were facing. Um, and then the final component was uh, sort of a clever strategic trick of making an alliance between the state and the municipalities, as the municipalities gained some of the tasks and some of the money from the regions, uh, and then squeeze out the, uh, the counties and establish the regions. And uh, the whole thing is, is part, though, of a longer uh, development trend towards the state taking more uh, control through economic means and through uh, these various types of uh, sort of standards, uh, various types of monitoration uh, mechanisms, and various types of sanctioning of what goes on at the, uh, cent uh, the decentralized uh, level. But that's, that's a bigger uh, story. And then other questions, uh, Lina Kais. Well, uh, it's a question of Sweden, because now we learned that actually we don't have one Swedish model in, in ward wall or patient choice, but several. So do we know anything about the effects in, in regional levels? So are the differences between the regions or can you say anything about that? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, uh, since, uh, yes, as Carsten was saying before, uh, we have um, 21 or 22 actually in Nortelia as well, uh, different uh, systems uh, for the patient choice uh, in uh, primary care. Uh, with, with regards to the effect, uh, there have been some studies uh, which have started, uh, but, and I'm doing some um, soon, but uh, we don't know yet. But I think everyone agrees that there are probably different effects in different regions. Anne Wellens. Hello, uh, my name is Anne Wellens and thank you very much for the interesting presentation. Um, I heard that both uh, countries, are, or all the three countries, are doing a lot of kind of piloting type of work to support uh, integration and kind of uh, establish new models of care. So um, I was just wondering about the financing, L like how much flexibility have you got at local level to join budgets between different sectors like uh, health and social care? Can you do like uh, personal budgets or pooled funding or um, how does it work? Yeah, so uh, this the situation in Denmark is that you, the municipalities have, have quite a lot of uh, leeway to, uh, to integrate, to, to do organizational uh, stuff, to combine things. Uh, of course, they have to take uh, the, the national legislation and, and the obligations from the national uh, legislation into consideration, but, but largely they can uh, experiment uh, on, their, on their own. So, um, yeah. That's the same uh, situation in Norway, too. After... Um, um, 
new law in 1992, I think. The Norwegian municipalities can uh, restructure their administration as they want. Uh, yes, generally. So, but uh, when it comes to financing, the uh, the tax level in in Norway is uh, has has a level, so th they can't. Uh, uh, they can't uh, implement uh, more taxes to budget some of these uh, reforms, mm. to fund some of these reforms. They can't. Mm. Some of the Norwegian uh, um, uh, municipalities have quite uh, heavy mm, economic burdens, I think. Mm. Please use the microphone. If, uh, can you can you join the budgets for health and social care, for instance, at local mm. level? I don't know. <laughs> so the answer is perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, with Swedish, uh, both uh, municipalities and the uh, regions are very autonomous. Uh, so there is a ceiling in some cases to what they can do. Uh, this is at, uh, by the national level. Uh, but generally, they, they can pretty much try out anything they want. Yeah. Now the next question there, please. Hi, my name is Evelina Leinonen, and I'm rep representing the Private Healthcare Service Producers Association in Finland. So, Mr. Runbeck, you said that there's uh, this national website for information for the patients to make their choice. So have you researched the patient's uh, opinions about the information? Is, it, is there enough information? Is it accurate? Do they, do they want more information? And also the same question for Sweden. Do the patients feel they have enough information for their choice? Um, there haven't been a recent evaluation of it. So the, the, the sort of scientific evaluations have, uh, are some years back. Uh, and uh, I guess it's a very sort of mixed message that you get from the uh, from the surveys that have been uh, that have been made. Uh, I mean, on the one hand, they, they, there's a tendency that patients demand more uh, information, and certainly if you go to the patient organizations, they would demand more information. But on the other hand, it's a it's a tricky balance because a lot of the very detailed quality information that you could put out there would simply not be comprehensible for the. Uh, for the for the patients uh, in that sense, so do they actually use it? Well, um, some of the studies that I did uh, in the 1990s uh, were that the patients they mostly relied on uh, sort of their GPs to act as uh, go-betweens and to interpret both the information available, but also just their personal networks within the, the hospitals. Uh, and they would also uh, listen to relatives, uh, and they would sort of. Um, Ask, ask around, so, so the general reputation of the, uh, of the treatment facilities is used more than, than this type of systematic uh, info. So I think you use it as a first entry and you use it as part of uh, your decision process, but then you use other channels for, for getting to the actual decision. That's, That's a good uh, uh, description of the situation in Norway too. When it comes and then Sweden. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty much the same. Uh, the Myndigheten för Gårdanalys uh, have done some of those uh, evaluations. And they found that the people do actually want more information, uh, but they don't use the information anyway. So <laughs> it's the same as in other international studies. Uh, and as Carson said, uh, they, they choose uh, um, primary healthcare centers who are close to them, and uh, um, healthcare centers that are recommended by friends and families. And Reputation, basically. Yeah. And do you have uh, any other questions, please? Yes, thank you a lot. My name is Jan Lesut. I'm representative for the primary health care. Uh, I wonder, Karsten, you named these um, health packages. I guess they're called Packefelöp or something like that. I run over them. Uh, they seemed very, very interesting. Do you think, or structured care, do you think they are working? Is, this, is that something that should be implemented in Finland, Sweden, Norway also? It seemed very interesting. Um, the uh, the packet for or the, uh, the 
the pathway descriptions for chronic care uh, are fairly recent, uh, so we don't really know if they work yet. We know that there are difficulties in getting them implemented uh, fully at the municipal level and, and sort of getting the interactions to work. But at least it gives um, some structure to the process and it, it uh, in terms of these healthcare agreements, it, it provides a tool that can be um, implemented and used in, in this uh, discussion. Uh, so in that sense, I think it's, it's, a, it's a good instrument. Um, we know that for for cancer care and uh, heart uh, surgery, the, uh, the the Danish outcome figures are much uh, better than they used to be, and and ascribe that partly to the uh, introduction of these uh, care packages. So I think it is working within the hospital setting, where you, you know that then you don't have the issue of cutting across the borders. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Please. Now you have the unique opportunity to. Uh, ask our colleagues. I, I think we'll have the other opportunity sometime later on this year, but uh, now this is the only opportunity today to ask our Nordic colleagues. Anne, please. Um, just a second question about the, like the gatekeeping role. You mentioned that um, GPs have got uh, the gatekeeping role. Um, would it be possible to hear a little bit more about um, how does that relate to kind of the decision, like whether kind of it's kind of more the cha uh, are we going to give patient a choice of provider or are we going to go for the integration pathway or how, how does that work in a practice kind of the decision making route? Yeah, uh, so the idea is that uh, that the, the GP really serves both as the uh, as a gateway, but also as the counselor for the uh, for the patient. Uh, so the counseling role deals more with the integration of services and and sort of keeping check of where you can go and the pro uh, the the pathways through the uh, system and so on. Uh, whereas uh, in terms of choice, uh, the the gateway is is that the uh, GP needs to to give the referral, and once you have the referral, uh, you can take that and and go anywhere and that's that's when the counseling comes in then then the gp becomes the counselor after having been the gatekeeper in a sense um i guess there is a sense that uh that the gps are less of gatekeepers than they were before so they're they're quicker at allowing patients to to move through the system so um there's some some slippage or some development uh, in that role as well i know i know there are there is a discussion about the great variation about among the GPs in referral praxis. So um, mm, there are some inequalities there uh, yeah, among practitioners and among um, regions, I think, too. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I'm Mary. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Mary Kovl. I come from uh, THL here, and I think my bag is stuck, so I'll ask for sitting down, unfortunately. Uh, I would like to ask you to kind of name three things, or one thing, that you see as the main good things in terms of the reforms. And some things that you, meant you think that, that, that could be the main vulnerabilities in how the reforms have been played out within your country. Uh, and, and then I would like to ask a little comment about equity implications and where you see it going in future and uh, cost implications and where you see it going in future. Thanks. Okay, I have, uh, there were quite a few questions. If you could uh, just uh, answer some of those, please. <laughs> Starting from Denmark. Um, yes, I think the 2007 reform uh, was important uh, in terms of of uh, creating a structure that enabled the regions to make these structural decisions on the hospital system. So that whole rationalization uh, of the hospital structure has, has uh, evolved uh, after the reform. And, and then I think uh, strengthening the municipalities and their capacity to, uh, to take on more tasks within uh, healthcare is going to become more and more important over time as you get more chronically ill persons and more with comorbidities, more uh, elderly uh, persons where a lot of their healthcare needs uh, can be dealt with at the local level rather than the specialized uh, level. 
The downsides, you have to remember the significant transaction costs in implementing a reform. It's not cheap to to do, and it's taken a, a long time before the sort of the administrative costs uh, are have have come down to the same level as they were before uh, the reform. So it, it's not it's not a, a free lunch in that way to to introduce reforms. Then no way. No way. And no, I, th I think um, there is a huge challenge in uh, having evaluation, more comprehensive evaluations of all the reforms that have been um, implemented. Uh, the hospital reform has um, been criticized for um, low, a low uh, democracy impact. It is uh, the enterprise model has uh, been mus much discussed and, uh, and uh, especially the mergers of the, many of the small uh, hospitals and, and, uh, and transferring uh, acute uh, entities and, and, uh, and maternity wards to, to more centralized par partial of Norway. The, uh, no, um, uh, this has really stressed the police, politicians bo both uh, at the national and the local level. And then we have the, um, the Norwegian labor and welfare reform which I didn't mention, and you asked about uh, the care, uh, the care area, and uh, care is not discussed uh, um, uh, together with uh, the hospital reform or, or the, and the newly, newly in initiated uh, municipal structure reform. We only dis discuss uh, care and social care uh, according to the uh, labor and welfare reform. And this is a hybrid reform with, uh, that mixes the municipal uh, responsibility for uh, social care with the national responsibility for the insurance uh, programs. So it's a, it's, a, it's a very hybrid reform that uh, has been much debated in, in Norway. So I think what stresses the Norwegian say, system at, uh, in, at all is all these uh, reforms that uh, are, are mixed together but not evaluated <laughs> uh, uh, comprehensively. Mm -hmm. And now the great the discussion is about uh, the municipal structures. I didn't uh, tell you that we have 428 municipalities in Norway. 50% of the municipalities has less than 5,000 in inhabitants. And now we have a, a large, uh, a huge reform Mm. being implemented and it, it, it's uh, we left to see what uh, what comes out of it mm. actually that was relieving to relieving to learn that uh, the average population is so small we have six six thousand but that's only median Sweden then yeah Sweden then and I'm guess I guess I will talk about the patient choice reform or reforms, actually. It's been a trend for the past uh, 20 years or so. And uh, I think the biggest change here is the role of the patient, uh, uh, where the patient uh, was quite passive before. Now it's been, became more active and more like a consumer, uh, for better or worse. Uh, we don't really know. Uh, and uh, about the trends, uh, I think it has a lot to do with the reimbursement systems and the, what people are talking about at the moment are mainly value-based care, uh, which is a vague, a vague term and no one really knows uh, what it is. But it is uh, something about measuring health or measuring outcomes of health uh, and try, try to implement that into the reimbursement uh, schemes. Uh, or you can also talk about the episode-based uh, reimbursements. Um, that's, uh, What's been discussed in, in Sweden uh, the past year, I think. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, okay. so follow up on, on the question of uh, equity. I think uh, this, uh, the structural reform in Denmark, by creating bigger units, has created large, uh, better geographical equity. And in fact, that was a driver behind the reform as, as well. Um, and contributing to that has been also the implementation of these benchmark uh, instruments and the, the standards and guidelines and so on. So that type of uh, equity is, is improved and will improve further uh, over time. But uh, then, uh, then we have the other trend of privatization uh, going on with uh, 
more voluntary uh, private health insurance, uh, introduction of, uh, of more private providers, etc. And that may uh, increase uh, other types of sort of social demographic uh, inequity in the system. So there are various uh, trends. Costs, uh, the reform was implemented uh, also as a way to, uh, to deal with the challenges you could see ahead in terms of aging populations and growing numbers of chronic care patients and so on by implementing services at what we call the, the lowest effective care level or cost level. Um, so the idea that pushing services down to the municipal level might be more cost efficient than dealing with them at the, uh, at the uh, specialized level. And at the same time, the same trend as in Finland and, and the other Nordic countries of uh, getting much more accelerated uh, hospital uh, care programs. Uh, and that, that in itself creates a need for the municipalities to step up their level of, of uh, services. Uh, but, well, we all know costs overall are going up, but uh, that's a different story. Yeah. There are still, still other questions or comments? If no, then I think that uh, we, have, we, have, we have to know that uh, we have uh, got uh, extremely heavy load of new information this morning, which we have to digest this afternoon perhaps and so tomorrow and the days to come and uh, I think that it's been very useful and uh, very informative session and we'll continue, we, we go, go on continue this uh, seminar in, in the afternoon, afternoon in our Finnish session. I'd like to thank you, our speakers and uh, hope that you'll join us to enjoy the lunch down there somewhere. Siis lounastauko, palaamme kello 13 tähän samaan tilaan. Kiitoksia teille.